It's quite an exciting event to be a part of, and I'm honored to have the opportunity. I'm honored that many of you chose to travel from around the country and the around the world to share this with us. We hope and expect that this will be a great day of learning, of sharing stories, of hearing about how people have faced similar challenges to you and found solutions. So with that, <clears throat> I want to jump in. I want to take you through a little bit of, a, of the evolution of chaos. So in the beginning, there was Chaos Monkey. Chaos Monkey was a very useful tool at Netflix to help prepare for the cloud. It enforced a great behavior that hosts could be rebooted from underneath you at any point. It helped by, the, the random nature of Chaos Monkey helped, helped impart the thought that this could happen at any time. And it's a great starting point. To begin with Chaos Monkey, you don't need a lot of maturity. A lot of people are, are willing to kind of take that first step here. One of the things that isn't so great about Chaos Monkey is that it's random. I just said it was good. It's good for enforcing behavioral change. But that can make it difficult to measure it, to understand how it impacts your systems. It's good as a as an organizational influence, but it may not be the best way to run experiments. Furthermore, it's a single failure mode. It's an interesting one, and it's one that we should start with. But as we mature and as we go along this journey, failing due to, or having outages due to a single host rebooting becomes less and less likely. We're able to handle that more. So the nice thing of beginning here is it helps us to start thinking about how we're gonna handle these failures. What are we gonna do when this occurs? What is our response? And just having that conversation be started, having us thinking about that is a very valuable place to begin. But as we mature, we need a little bit more. And so what we found is that we need to move into a more diverse set of failures. It's not enough that simply hosts can be rebooted. We could have services where our CPU is pegged. We could have an application with a memory leak. What happens when daylight savings happens or there's a leap second? What happens if our processes die? Do we reset them? Do we restart them? And as funny as it is and a little bit embarrassing to say, every company and almost everyone I've spoken to has had an outage related to a disk filling up and it not being handled correctly. So as we mature, we need to handle a wider set of failures. And to do that, we need to take a bit more of a disciplined approach. The random approach of, of just breaking everything, when you start doing it across many different failure modes, would start to become very noisy. We might be painful to our customers. The goal here, and the goal of chaos engineering in general, is to prevent customer pain. And so we want to be very thoughtful about how we're running these experiments. So in this scenario, we need to be a bit more disciplined. We're thinking in terms of hypotheses. What do we think the system will do when it fails? We're thinking in terms of measuring outcomes. How do we ensure that the system fails correctly? And what is the correct measure of failure in our system? It's very important to be mindful of what our customers are experiencing and being thoughtful about preventing pain to them while we're running experiments. And really, to do this, this requires that we have a, a degree of basic operational readiness. If we haven't yet uh, developed good monitoring or good alerting, then we may not be ready to cause these more in-depth failures. And in fact, this becomes a great place for us to validate our operational maturity. The ability to test that we get engaged when something goes wrong. As silly as that may sound to some, uh, I've been part of many outages where someone joined 20 or 30 minutes late because their, their engagement wasn't set up correctly. Our monitors and our dashboards track the things that we think they're tracking. Uh, again, it might sound silly, but I've seen outages where we spent 10 or 15 minutes looking in a region at a dashboard that was configured incorrectly, and it led us down the wrong path when we could have been more focused on the failure that happened. So this is good, and the theme here is, can I handle the things that happen to me? 
But as we mature, we need to go beyond that. And the next phase is really one where we, not hand, we, don't, we handle not only our failures, but we handle our dependency failures. There's a, there's a great story about one of our providers at Gremlin, and they had a, a couple of hours of downtime in the last month. And unfortunately, in their incident review, they essentially pointed at Azure and said, it was their fault. Now, as somebody who's written a lot of software and focused on resilience, I can understand and empathize with that statement, but ultimately, it's not acceptable. As a customer, I pay them to be available. I pay them for their service. I don't pay Azure, that's an indirect relationship. So when we, we as the guardians of our customer behavior, of our customer trust, have to be able to handle things that happen not only to us, but things that happen to our dependencies. So how do we do this? As we mature in the way we think about things, we can start to look at network failures. So what happens when a data center fails? What happens when a region fails? What occurs when there's a network partition or a large amount of packet loss? And in this case, there's inherently a larger blast radius. So if you're new to chaos engineering, the concept of the blast radius is that we always wanna think about the risk of running an experiment. We coin that as the blast radius. And whenever we're running experiments, we always wanna to try to minimize that blast radius. We always want to try to de-risk things as much as possible. It may be worth just stating explicitly that this idea of minimizing risk is really at the heart of what chaos engineering is all about. We all make trade-offs, we all have risks in our system. How we deal with those risks and how we quantify them and how we judge how important they are and how much time to spend on them is a key aspect of how we learn about how our systems fail. So in this case, we need something that's a little bit more wider scoped. Network failures inherently are distributed. And it's, it's funny, with the rise of microservices, with the rise of distributed systems, while it allows us to move more quickly and be more agile as teams, we've also introduced the network in between everything. There's one of the classic programmer fallacies, the network is reliable. And the network is not reliable. It will cause pain, it will cause trouble. So when we're running these experiments, we don't necessarily know the knock-on effects. We could be impacting our, one of our dependencies. You know, we could be testing what happens when we lose a zone or a region. But we may have an inadvertent side effect or a knock-on effect. And that's good. We want to find those. The cascading failures and the things that could go wrong later are absolutely important to discover. But as such, it requires us to take a more coordinated effort where when we're running Chaos Monkey or we're running infrastructure failures, maybe that's just us and our team. But when we're running these network failures or larger scale ones, we need to be doing it more like a game day. We need to be coordinating with other teams. We need an opportunity to have many eyes keeping an eye on things. And this is, this is a great opportunity to practice. The same as practicing our operations, practicing our coordination amongst teams. Because if a large scale event happens, if there's a network partition, then we will have to work together as a company to get that opportunity to practice. As a little tangent, uh, you know, I, I often joke, the on-call training at every company I've been at essentially amounts to, here's your pager, good luck. <clears throat> Maybe there's a dashboard over there. Who knows if it's up to date? Maybe there's a run book. Imagine instead a world where when you joined a team, they said, look, we're going to help you train for operations on our team. We're going to run an experiment or a game day. Maybe we're gonna tell you about it, maybe we're not. But we're gonna do it in a safe way. We're gonna have a safety net. We're gonna know what failures we're introducing. But we want you to treat it like a real incident. To be engaged, to look at your run book, to look at your dashboard. To be able to ask questions during the day when things are a little bit more sane as opposed to in the middle of the night when everyone is urgently trying to address the problem. So this game day process is a way for us to test how our teams work together, how our company's organization operational process fits together. And that's a key aspect. Do we join a conference bridge? Do we hang out on Slack? Do we go to someone's desk? What do we do as a company when things go wrong? And it's very valuable to be asking those questions and getting the answers. 
So this sounds good, this sounds valuable, but there's some toughness that comes with this. There's some difficulties. Let's take a real scenario to talk about where I think this process starts to break down. We have an incident that recently occurred. And from the provenance, from the metrics, we're able to tell that it really only impacted Android users. We think we've got a solution that we can test a fix for, but we wanna, we wanna roll it out in a thoughtful way. We wanna validate it without, by minimizing that blast radius. What we would really like to do is test only against Android users and not against iPhone or other mobile users. We wanna isolate the traffic. How do we do this at the network level? Well, one of the problems with the network level is that it's packet focused. We're dealing a lot in terms of IP addresses and ports, these streams between services. If we've moved into a managed environment for using Kubernetes, for using service meshes, we may not even know what the IP addresses or the ports of our services are. That may be abstracted from us. So how do we construct this safe experiment using this knowledge? The problem here is that operators don't think in terms of packets. Operators think in terms of requests. And when we look at the request level, we see much more information that is available to us to make better decisions upon. What country did this request come from? What company does it belong to? What team? What user or user agent? So here we start to have the availability to capture this information and to be able to do, make more intelligent decisions. And so as we're, as we're maturing, we learn that the host level failures and the network level failures are necessary to building a robust and resilient system, but not sufficient. We need more. We need a finer granularity. We need to be able to control that blast radius to make experimentation easier and safer. So how do you accomplish that? Well, one thing I'm very proud to announce today is a new product that we've launched at Gremlin called Alfie, Application Layer Fault Injection, Application Level Fault Injection. <laughs> and what, what's exciting about this approach is it helps address this exact problem. We want to be able to go run very safe, constrained experiments within our environments. We want to minimize the risk and the overhead. And we want to keep this blast radius as small as possible. So with that, let me give you a little bit more information about how this works and how you might apply this approach. So the key at this level is really about validating the user experience. When your service fails, when your endpoint fails, when your application fails, what does a user see? More than just ensuring that your hosts stay up or that your service is healthy, when things go wrong, what is the customer going to think? What are they going to say? And one of the ways that we're able to validate this is to make it very easy for us to run these experiments and see for ourselves what our users are seeing. Now in this case, it's, it's a bit more of an advanced technique in that we need monitoring, we need operational readiness, and if we're starting to dip our toe into the world of what debatedly, or <laughs> what debatedly might be called observability, the ability to really go in real time and understand how our system is behaving and what's going wrong. So how, how do we achieve this greater precision? Because the key here is these precision experiments. There's this concept of coordinates. In the end of the day, our applications essentially boil down to a lot of key value pairs about how we slice and dice and define our infrastructure. And so in this case, what do we have available to us that we could leverage to build safer experiments or to scope how we exercise these? There are things that occur at the application level, a user, a device type, a user agent. What A-B tests are they in? There are platform level concerns. What region did it come from? What service does it belong to? What dependency, things on our side, things in our control. Now the nice thing, as, as programmers and engineers, is that if this essentially results in a key value pair that allows us to do slicing and dicing intelligently on our experimentation, then really anything we know about 
can be an attribute that we use. And this is the key power, the key flexibility, that at the end of the day, whatever it is that's important to you, we, Gremlin, or me, I don't need to know that. We can build it in a way that allows you to manage it. So to give you a quick code example of how this looks, here's, a, here's an opportunity to divide, uh, to define custom coordinates. In this case, it's a relatively straightforward example. We care about customers, we care about devices, we care about country. One of the keys here is it doesn't matter if your company uses customer ID or CID or C underscore ID or device or device type, whatever it is can be available for us to exercise and to run our experiments on. There's a little bit of code integration that comes with this approach. When we're doing application level, we no longer have an agent on the box. We're no longer directly impacting some cloud provider's API. We need to be able to be in the application to have access to this information. Think of it like cut points or aspects, the ability to annotate a function and be able to then arbitrarily inject failure in that function, maybe even just a subset of function, subset of traffic. So with that, let me, let me give you some examples, some use cases. Always works better with a story. Uh, it's always a little easier to grok when you can see real world examples of how this is leveraged. So the first one is something that I've used several times in running experiments in the past, being very targeted. I've discussed a bit about this concept of the blast radius, but in this case, we want to be able to run our experiments from zero to 100 in a safe way that mitigates the risk. Remember, the goal is never to break customers. The goal here is to prevent customers from feeling pain. And so the way that we do that is we first test on ourselves. We run a single experiment and we impact our user or our device or a device in our control. If we have a device lab, maybe we're going and running on a specific iPhone or Android device. And we're gonna see what happens when we cause a failure. We may fail a service, we may fail a region, we may fail a subset of our platform functionality. And when this occurs, if the user experience for us is broken, if it fails, then we're done. We know it doesn't meet our expectations. We know it doesn't do what we want it to. If it does meet our expectations, if we gracefully degrade, if we handle that failure without diminishing the user experience, then we have an opportunity to increase that failure scope, that blast radius. Now we run for 1% of users, or maybe 1% of users in the East region, or maybe 1% of users in the East region that are Android users. We can compose these to be very careful and thoughtful about who we're going to impact. And then if that works the way we expect, and we're gonna be very diligent, we're gonna be measuring carefully, for that 1% of users, are they experiencing pain? You know, we may have customer success in the room or support listening, testing to see if there's anything going wrong. Again, if at any point things go wrong, we're done. We've won. We found something that shouldn't be, and we can go fix it. If it works correctly, we'll scale it more. We'll go to 10%. We'll go to 25%. We'll go up to 100%. And we learn different things at different scales. At the small scale, the single request, the user, 1%, we might be learning whether or not we handle an exception whether or not we've written a fallback that works with our user interface, whether or not we handled null correctly. At the large scale, we're testing a different set of criteria for our system. Do we gracefully degrade if we receive too much traffic? Do we shed load to protect ourselves? Are we a good citizen and backing off of downstream dependencies with an exponential or a back off strategy, or do we just fast retry and, and bury that service? And so it's very interesting and useful to be able to test these things. These are key aspects of ensuring our systems behave correctly. My, one of my pet peeves is, is timeouts. I think, and, and I'm a lazy engineer, so don't, don't take offense at this, but we tend to look at a graph and draw a line and say nothing should ever pass this, timeout's good, ship it. But timeouts are built to protect us when things are going wrong. So if we haven't actually seen how they behave when our system's under duress, when it's underwater, when it's having trouble, then we may not know if that timeout actually protects us 
or if it's too lenient, and it still allows us to get into trouble. So this is one approach. Another approach is the ability to quickly and without a lot of overhead reproduce an outage. So this is a real story. There's a member on my team that experienced an outage. And while this outage was going on, he had a good idea about what might have been happening underneath the covers. He had a hypothesis. And what he was able to do was to go create an experiment impacting only his user and testing this hypothesis. What happens if, let's say it's the identity service or something of that nature? What if that fails? Is that what would cause this? Now, this engineer was able to go run this experiment. This is, this is in the context of an outage. You know, we're 20 minutes into an outage. We've triaged things. We see that there's this subset of users impacted. We've got this hypothesis. This engineer is able to go and run this experiment against his own user, testing this hypothesis. What happens is it fails. You know, he pulls out his phone, or he, he hits a web page, and he loads it, and he sees the same failures that users are seeing. So this confirms his suspicion. Now he's able to go log into boxes, find logs, find the metrics or the provenance that show why that failed. And from that, he was able to derive what the root cause of the problem was and how to fix it. In this case, 20 minutes after the triage of the outage was done, a pull request was ready to fix it. Now this may sound like a simple thing, but there's something inherently powerful about empowering engineers to go and, and answer these questions quickly. When we're running game days, when we're running large-scale failure tests, there's a lot of coordination. We want to do it safely, and there's value in that coordination. But at times, we would like to quickly and easily answer questions. This could happen while we're developing the code. Oftentimes, some of this work gets left until it's time to deploy or it's time to harden a service. But if it's easy to do, then it may be something that your teams or your engineers are willing to do more ad hoc or as part of the development process. It's much easier to fix some of these things when you're aware of them during design and early implementation as opposed to once things have been deployed. This is something that we believe deeply in at Gremlin, making it easy for people to do the right things. I've seen this in action many times at companies I've been a part of. If you have a very clever tool and it's difficult to use, people won't, won't put the time into it and they won't get the value from it. If it's straightforward, if it's easy, we've seen a prevalence of, of good user interfaces and good DevOps tools, then people will be more willing to spend time. Because at the end of the day, it's a trade-off of how much time you have and what you're able to accomplish. And so making it easy for people to quickly do their jobs, to save them time. One of the core tenets to me of chaos engineering is that we're investing this time up front to save time later. If we, can, if we can spend 10% of our time today and not have to deal with 25% of our time dealt with outages later, then we've just saved 15% of our time. And we can focus more on our features and on the aspects of our application. And then there's this new technology. It's got a little buzz. You might have heard of it. Serverless, Lambda, Azure Functions. There's a lot of interest and in, in, research going on into the space. A lot of companies are deciding and debating which part of their applications to move and how to run in these environments. Well, the downside of serverless is also its upside. There's no host to manage. There's no host to reboot. Chaos Monkey can't do a whole lot here. There's not uh, processes to kill. A lot of the failure modes have been abstracted away from us. They allow us to focus on the code and on the application, but that doesn't absolve us of having to deal with failure. Quite the opposite. The user experience is still in our hands. And whether that's a developer's user experience or an end user's experience, it's key that we're mindful of that responsibility. So the ability to take this approach and apply it in a serverless environment allows us to build trust and confidence as we migrate and move into that environment. And that's a common pattern I see for chaos engineering as well. People are, are looking at Kubernetes, they're looking at serverless, they're looking at new ideas, but before they put all their eggs in one basket, move production over carte blanche, they want to ensure that it fails and behaves the way they expect. This is a great opportunity to test that. 
So what does this look like? How do you use it? How would you run it? I've got a, a little demo here, a recorded one, uh, to show you what it looks like in action. Here we have an opportunity to choose what kind of failure. Do we want to fail in Lambda and EC2? We have an opportunity to filter down what traffic we're going to impact. In this case, we're going to impact all zones, all regions, all instances, but we're going to narrow it down to a specific service. Only requests going from the picture service are going to be impacted. Everything else will be left alone. Then we're going to choose how we want to fail it. Is this, are we failing inbound traffic, outbound traffic, database traffic? In this case, we're gonna, we're gonna fail HTTP traffic. Any verb, but any outbound call to the pictures API is gonna be impacted. In this case, we're gonna cause 50% of our impact. 50% of the traffic will be impacted. And in this case, we're also gonna further narrow it down so that only Android traffic is receiving this pain. So everything else remains alone. And we're gonna introduce some delay, two and a half seconds. What do our users see, or what do our Android users see if aspects of the application slow down or begin to fail? So with that, let's take a look at what this, what this looks like in action. So here we have two phones, maybe one's an Android, maybe one's an iPhone. And on the left, we see things behaving kind of as normal. It loads, it takes a little bit of time. But on the right, we see this increased delay being added for a subset of pictures. 50% are being delayed even more. From this, it really helps us to understand what do our users see when things slow down? Is this an acceptable user experience? Are we comfortable with this? If you're testing, uh, since we're talking about mobile, if you're testing mobile applications and you're always testing you know, right next to the server with a very fast ping time, do you know what it looks like for your customers on a 2G network on the other side of the world? It's a useful, it's a useful tool to be able to answer and understand these questions. What happens when things fail, if we introduce exceptions? In this case, we want to test that we have a fallback or that we gracefully degrade. In this case, our application doesn't crash. The whole thing doesn't fail. We catch these exceptions. In this case, we're showing the handsome gremlin mascot in its loo. But again, if we hadn't handled this exception or null well, the entire screen might have broken. So maybe this is appropriate. Maybe this is where now we layer in retries on those failures. Maybe we have fallback images we want to use. But the point is we can see how it behaves for our customers, and we can test and execute that. So I'm proud to say that Alfie is available today for any Gremlin customers or anyone that's interested in participating in one of our free trials. <laughs> Thank you. There's been a lot of great work by my team, and I want to recognize them in bringing this to fruition and building it, making it work in a generic way that everyone can leverage and really take advantage of the strength of this approach. Today, it's a Java-based language support, but it soon will be adding JavaScript, .NET, Python, Go, whatever your favorite language is. We know and we've heard a lot about service meshes, and the short answer is they seem like a good place to inject failure. They're a natural cut point in our applications. And so we feel like this is a great opportunity to integrate those, to make those available to us in our infrastructure to be failed. And as we start to look at this request level granularity, this very fine-grained granularity, things like tracing become much more interesting. What does the call graph look like when things go wrong? How does it change? From that, we can better understand how our services fit together and how they change in the face of failure. So we're very excited not only for what we have today, but for the future work that we're gonna continue going, bringing. And so with that, I'm also proud to announce that Gremlin has closed our Series B. We're excited to welcome Redpoint Ventures. Thank you. We're excited to, to welcome Redpoint Ventures into the Gremlin family. And we're going to take this opportunity, this support and this investment, to continue focusing on what we think is important at Gremlin. We believe that we win when the industry wins. We believe that when all engineers get paged less, have more resilient systems, 
that the world's a better place. We live in a day and an age where the internet and our software is paramount to not just our comfort, but our, our, vital, our daily lives. When airlines fail, people get delayed. When self-driving cars fail, what happens? These things are critical to us. And so this opportunity for us to continue investing in educating the industry, in teaching people what we've learned, in helping to build community and build events like this is very important. And this will allow us to continue pushing the state of the art in chaos engineering and building resilient systems. So with that, thank you very much. I'm excited to have you all here. I think it's going to be a great day of learning and education. And thank you all for coming. Thank you.